5 o'clock in the afternoon, I was supposed to finish my double shift. However, my captain, Dan Kiesner, advised me to leave early because, besides, there was no serious situation. My name is John Taylor, and I am a lieutenant with the Minneapolis Police Department. There is a narcotics task force in Northern Plains, and I am now their liaison officer. Yes, it's a well-known name, but if you imagine it's a division of the Drug Enforcement Administration, Dia, you'll understand. By 3.30, I had accepted Dan's offer to depart early and was on my way home. It took me approximately 30 minutes to drive home from my home in Maple Grove, which is located on the northwest edge of the metro region. After a double, I was completely exhausted, so I was relieved to get off early. My only desire upon returning home was to unwind with a beer and some food. Then I was planning to get some much-needed sleep and tend to the wife. My wife Kathy and her twin sister Sharon were chatting by the pool when I walked into the house. Both of them were roofless, and I swear to you, there have never been four more breathtaking views on this planet. Besides, it was old news. It wasn't uncommon for them to bask in the sun without cover, and I think it happened even in my presence. Sharon and I had been dating even before I met Kathy. And yes, I had slept with her. When I dated her, she was stunning, incredibly attractive, full of life and incredibly intelligent. I didn't mind in the slightest that she stayed topless. I met Sharon's sister Kathy through her introduction, and we hit it off right away. She embodied Sharon in every way, but there was an additional quality that made her irresistible to me. It was love at first sight and the fact that it was reciprocated was a miracle. Not long after we were introduced, Sharon also saw it and remarked, with a laugh, that she couldn't compete with love. She then bowed out while laughing. After kissing me and telling me to look after her sister, she embraced Kathy, wished her happiness, and told her she loved her. After that, she ignored us and strode out the door. Our marriage, which took place a few months later, has now lasted for five years. We haven't started a family yet, but we've been discussing the possibility. I know we were both overjoyed to be together and eager to start a family. Getting back to the here and now, I glanced at them and thought, this is perfect. A smile spread across my face. Put on my suit, get a beer, and come hang out with them by the pool. Take it easy, soak up some sun suds and eye candy. I can't think of a better way to kill time this afternoon. Just as I was about to descend the stairs after putting on my suit, Kathy and Sharon entered the kitchen. I could see that Sharon was quite unhappy with Kathy because of the passionate debate they were having. Sharon's tone was a bit higher when she inquired, How could you do that to John? He loves you more than anything, and he would be devastated if he found out you cheated on him. In fact, I am pretty sure he would divorce you if you cheat on him. Don't do it, Kathy. Please don't do it. John will never know, and you'd better not tell him either, Kathy said. I just have to do it, Sharon added. We talked about starting a family, and then I'll be a mother, and I can never do it again. I just want to know what it feels like. Saturday night when we were dancing, Phil pulled me so close to him that I could feel him rubbing his whole body against me, and that's when I got so damn hot. I wanted to have sex with him right there on the dance floor because he was acting so nasty and telling me all the things he would do to me if he had the chance. Back home, I did fulfill my fantasy after all. Phil called me yesterday and said he knew John was leaving Friday for a seminar and would be gone all night, and he wanted to take me out to dinner and then show me that he wasn't kidding about how he would treat me if I went to bed with him. I couldn't help myself and told him yes. Sharon's voice was sobbing. Kathy, it would be the worst mistake you ever made in your life to let Phil Swanson anywhere near you. He is a slime ball, and you would be nothing to him. John adores you, Kathy, and you will break his heart. He is the best man in the whole world. He is handsome, Fun to be with, and yes, he is a spectacular lover. You know I know that. How could you ever want anything else? According to Kathy, I know John is wonderful. 
I love him to death, too. And I wouldn't want to hurt him, but he won't find out, and this will be the only time I ever cheat on him. It will be over, and we will start our family, and I will never have to wonder again what it would be like, because I will have done it, even if he would find out, and he won't. But if he did, he loves me so much I am sure I could talk him into forgiving me and moving on. You know, Kathy, Sharon continued, you're putting all your eggs in that statement, and I really think you're foolish for thinking this way. You could fool John. You could go undetected. But you'll always be known as a cheat, and that will change you. Who knows what will happen to your relationship. If you go through with this plan, you're going to lose. I love you, Kathy, and I always will. But if you act in this way, you will also lose my respect. I will not go into further detail on this. Shall we return to the pool to sip our remaining beverages? After that, I'll be leaving. Give serious consideration to your next move. I was already devastated by the news, but it didn't help that Sharon liked me and was supportive of me. Our mutual friend Phil Swanson was apparently just as hot for Kathy as I was, but he wasn't her husband. I was, and he would pay the price. In my current state of anger, I knew I couldn't face them. Otherwise, I may do something that would land me in serious trouble. As they made their way to the pool, I crept back upstairs, changed into the clothing I had removed earlier, and made my way to my car, driving away. Kathy, I just got off work early, and I am going to stop at the cavern to have a few beers with some of the guys. I left Kathy a message when I called our home number while I was gone from the house, knowing that I would hear voicemail. Our shift has been lengthy, so now we're going to relax for a while. You can have dinner first as I may be running a bit behind schedule. Until then, I love you. Regardless, I let myself go, and by 10, 0 P. M. M. Bill, the bartender at the cavern, had summoned a cab and sent me on my way. Thereafter, I awoke at approximately 9, 0 A. M. M. The next morning, completely disoriented, I received a note from Kathy, and it was anything but cordial. She was incredibly angry with me for getting drunk and destroying our evening plans before I left town for the seminar. In her note, she went into detail about everything I had missed and how I would have to wait until I returned before I could receive any affection from her. And even then, it would depend on how angry she was. She had no idea that I got drunk on purpose just so I could avoid making love to her. Not last night, and probably never again. My day began with a phone call to the captain, where I explained the situation and begged him not to send me to the seminar. Then I did what any betrayed husband would do. I went to the bank, transferred half of our savings into a new savings account and a new checking account with my name only. I left the money in the general checking account because I had no intention of not paying bills and didn't want the law to come crashing down on me. Next, I contacted my broker to move half of our assets into a separate brokerage account that is only in my name. I had the other half of the funds from our money market account transferred to my new checking account. Finally, I contacted my attorney and had him rewrite my will to remove Kathy and leave my assets to Sharon. I then contacted all of my life insurance companies to change the beneficiaries to my sister-in-law, Sharon Burke. I sat down to think about what else required doing now that I had finished all that. I didn't answer my cell phone when it rang at 5.30 p.m. M. But I did hear the beep that said I had fresh voicemail a few moments later. The call had come from Kathy. John, you jerk, she began. You were so inebriated last night that you failed to even answer my call when I called you. No need to contact me again, sir. I'm not picking up the phone either. When you return home tomorrow, I will meet you there. May your night be filled with wonder. So long. I was so upset by her reaction that I cried into my drink. Now I guess I'll just have to wait till tonight to find out how things went out. She's planning to cheat on me with Phil and gets angry at me whenever I drink. At about 6.30 p.m. 
Mm. Mm. Kathy and Phil were seated at a table in Vito's Italian restaurant in Pine Springs, an eastern suburb of St. Paul. The restaurant was located about 40 minutes east of Maple Grove and had obviously been selected for its seclusion. They were sipping wine before dinner and were both excited about the delicious food and the sexual encounter they had planned for later. Are you Kathy Taylor? A huge man in a dark blue pinstripe suit said as he approached the table, a slight smile playing on his lips. He then showed her a manila packet and announced, You have been served, after she confirmed that she was Kathy Taylor. I am delivering this envelope to you at your husband John's request. Looking up at Phil, he questioned, Philip Swanson? A messenger brought this letter to your wife Sarah this afternoon. And here is a copy of it, Phil added after receiving a yes from Sarah. Your parents in Oakdale and all the couples in your Maple Grove area also received it. I hope you two have a fantastic evening. And with that, he departed. After glancing at the letter, Phil noticed that it detailed everything John had heard about Phil's behavior with Kathy, including his sexual advances and the words and actions he had used. It also detailed the plans they had made for when he was out of town. I have no knowledge if they have ever had sex before or if they will continue with their plans for later this evening, after being confronted. But their actions are deplorable. I just wanted every one of you to know what kind of a sleaze Phil really is, Phil stated. The manila envelope Kathy opened revealed a familiar document, a fully executed order for legal separation. Her eyes widened in shock as she moaned softly, Oh no, oh no. Oh no, oh no. Tears began to fall from her eyes as she continued to mutter. Oh no, oh no, oh no, 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 no. Then Phil finally spoke up, saying, Kathy, I really should take you home. Phil, I refuse to let you take me home. This has to stop now, she glared at him and proclaimed, A cab is what I need. After saying, Okay, I understand. Phil promptly stood up, tossed some cash on the table to pay for it, and left. Kathy requested the hostess to summon a cab since she needed to be alone in order to read John's letter. She promptly set out for home after the cab arrived. It felt like an eternity until she finally reached home. But once she did, she sat fearfully in the kitchen chair and nervously opened the envelope containing John's letter. My dear Kathy, you already know that I'm aware of your intentions to cheat on me with Phil Swanson. I know you're probably wondering how I found out, and you might assume that Sharon had something to do with it. I must correct you. Sharon is the most wonderful sister and friend anyone could ask for. If only you had listened to her. I got off work early yesterday and upon returning home, I noticed you two lounging by the pool. I couldn't wait to join you in admiring your attractive bodies, so I sneaked upstairs to change and was planning to join you. I was standing on the stairs when you two walked into the kitchen. And yes, I heard every word. I overheard you talking about how Phil made you feel sexy and how you wanted to have sex with him on the dance floor. I remembered how you had sex with me that night, and I felt bad that it was because of him and not because you were sexy for me. I overheard you talking about how you liked the way he rubbed against you and that you didn't value our marriage enough to resist him. I overheard you say that you only need Phil once before you become an old mom. Because of the love we share, you could get away with anything, and I would forgive and forget, as you said when we were talking about how much you loved me and how you knew I loved you. I also learned about the wonderful friend Sharon is to me, she tried her hardest to get you to see the light about the damage you were planning to do to our marriage, but you refused to listen and insisted on carrying it out, nevertheless. My love for you, Kathy, began the second I laid eyes on you, and you know it. It's a love that will never fade, but I will not stand for injustice. That is why I became a police officer, and it has guided my life too. The legal separation notice that you hold in your hands was executed when we were engaged. Your parents were going through a nasty divorce, so you were hesitant to get engaged, let alone married. 
After much discussion, we agreed to have these papers prepared, including separation and divorce papers, so that if we ever wanted to end our marriage, we could simply submit them to the courts. There would be no questions, no fighting, and no blame. I have already given you the separation papers, and they will be sent to family court first thing Monday morning. If we haven't reconciled within six months, we've agreed that we'll file for divorce. My attorney has all the paperwork needed to handle this automatically, unless I tell him to stop the proceedings so it's all under his control. Since I will be absent, Kathy, I want you to carefully consider your actions over the next few months. I have asked for and been granted a permanent assignment to the task force, so you will have plenty of time to reflect. While you read this, I have already gone undercover and am working to bust up one of the biggest narcotic operations in the cities. It will take time and effort to get into their operation, so I expect to be out of circulation for a while. Carolyn Hofstetter is my handler. You can call her if you want, but she won't be able to pass along messages. It would be too dangerous if anyone found out, both for you and me. No matter what happens, I swear to you that we will talk at least once. I really hope that in the next few months you will be able to figure out what makes you happy. Clearly, it wasn't being married to me. Kathy, I'm sure I'll have more to tell you when I get my head straight. For now, I simply don't know what else to say, and I don't want to hear what you have to say. In closing, I must confess, I have strong feelings for you, dear John. Tears streaming down Kathy's face. She sat there and wondered how she had been so foolish. She loved John with all her heart, but she had driven him away, realizing she had cheated on her husband, and he knew it. Kathy did the only thing she could think of. She called her sister Sharon. Sharon, John has served me with the separation papers we signed all those years ago after he learned about Phil. I asked him why he needed time alone to consider this, and he said he went undercover with the Dia so I can't reach him. I don't know what to do, sister. You squandered the greatest man the world has, the best friend and lover we've ever had, Kathy. All because you had a fantasy about Phil. I bequeathed my one and only love, John, to you, since I could see that his love for you outweighed his love for me. In hindsight, I regret it since I would never have caused him such heartache as you did. Sharon, I needed to hear that right now, so thank you very much. Nevertheless, I am aware that you are correct. At this point, I am going to end the call and go to bed sobbing. It would be very appreciated if you could call me when you're calm tomorrow or Sunday. Hey, Sharon remarked with a hint of amusement. I apologize for how I'm feeling right now, but rest assured, I will overcome this and continue to be the sister that always comes to your rescue. It is no secret to you. Farewell, Kathy. If you are able, get some rest. I will be here tomorrow to assist you in putting everything back together. Thanks, Sharon. Good night. Hi, honey, this is John, I said to Sharon over the phone a month later on a Sunday afternoon. Hearing your voice again is the best, John. Am I doing well? We were worried sick about you, Kathy and I, and we couldn't find out anything. We learn that you have disappeared after she contacted Carolyn. I was under the impression that you were to maintain communication with your handler, but they claim to be completely unaware of your whereabouts and activities. Well, Sharon, he began, but before I answer your questions, I'm all right. I just assumed that Kathy would be too preoccupied with her dreams with Phil to give a hoot about me. My second reason for going off the grid is that I had accomplished a lot at work and thought I could be even more productive if I did so, even though I know they disapprove, and that word will get out when I come out. I am confident that they are pleased with my results thus far. Now, let me tell you why I called you. I was deeply hurt, and naturally angry when I heard what Kathy had planned. You are aware that we had those agreements signed due to the events surrounding your parents' divorce. It was mostly Kathy's idea, but it turned out to be a good one. Now, she can do what she wants and it eliminates some of the conflicts. Before I depart once more, 
I only have a few inquiries and a few requests. To begin, is she still seeing Phil? Has she found a new romantic interest? She slept with him, didn't she? John, she hasn't slept with anyone or seen anyone since that night with Phil. She refused to even allow Phil to take her home after you had her served. She requested a taxi. You have my word that I have been observing her, and she is being the model of a devoted wife who patiently awaits the return of her beloved. Because of what she did to you, and because you abandoned her, she is distressed. John, your wife's foolishness is causing her more pain than you can fathom. I wish you had contacted her instead, but I know she will be overjoyed that you did. John, help her out. Tell me when you're planning to return. Sharon, I refuse to give her a call. Even if I want, she would continue to suffer. I feel terrible that she is. Without me, I don't think she would be able to imagine what her life would be like. She has to realize the significance of the bond she once shared with you. I understand how she feels, and I miss her and you as well. Our chances of a happy long marriage are dwindling unless she realizes it. At least you're right that she isn't sleeping around, but it has only been a little period, and she still hasn't caved. Just so you know, I won't be back for a while. This project could take a few more months, and it's safer for both of us if we're completely apart. I'll give you an update when I'm done, but I won't call her. And if you agree, don't tell her I called you. I want her to know that she misses, wants, and needs me. I know it's harsh, but I didn't cause this problem, and she needs to know what she wants. Finally, I just wanted to say how much I appreciate you being the ideal sister-in-law a man could ask for. All I can say is that I wished Kathy had have paid attention to what you two said that day in the kitchen, no matter if she took or left your counsel. I appreciate your encouragement that day. A man can't help but adore a sister-in-law as lovely as you, Sharon. I have to run. I will talk to you again in a month. Bye. Sharon was unable to find the words to express her feelings, but she managed to utter, By John, she really does love you. As she overheard John end the call, she said, And I love you too, John. After a month had passed, John still hadn't called Sharon, despite her expectations. After two months of no word, she decided to give Carolyn Hofstetter another call to find out what had happened. Carolyn, this is John Taylor's sister-in-law. Sharon Burke and I am worried about John. He called me a month after he went undercover and talked for a little while, and promised me he would call me again in a month. But now it is two months later, and he hasn't called. Is there anything you can tell me? John Taylor has gone into deep cover and is completely off our grid. Sharon, you are the name on our contact list for him but I really don't know where he is, what he's been up to, or whether he's okay anymore. Our office has been receiving a considerable number of anonymous tips regarding drug dealers and deals that are going down, which is the only clue I have as to his well-being. In addition to making a large number of arrests, we have also established a number of confidential informants, CIS, who have been an invaluable asset. Someone is really helping us out with information, and it's having a significant impact on drug trafficking in the upper Midwest. I'm leaning toward John as the likely culprit, but I can't say for sure. I will update you as soon as I come across any credible information regarding John. We can only wait for events to unfold until then, unless, of course, he is seen somewhere. Despite John's earlier request, Sharon informed Kathy of all the details because she loved her and didn't want her sister to suffer any more than she had to. Sharon thought her sister had been foolish to act the way she had. Carolyn Hofstetter called Sharon one morning after nearly another full month had passed, asking Sharon Burke. Yes, this is Sharon. No way for me to give John Taylor any information over the phone, although I do have a little bit. To have this conversation at my office, I propose that we collect you and John's wife. I need to know what's going on, and this sounds pretty serious. I'm becoming very concerned, Sharon responded. As previously mentioned, 
Carolyn is unable to address any matters with her over the phone. However, she is available throughout the day, so maybe we could arrange to pick her up shortly after lunch. Give it a little more time. 1. 30, please. As well as ample opportunity for conversation. Agent Jackson and Agent Pierce will be the ones to come get you. Always request identification from them. And Sharon, I beg you, don't tell anyone other than John's wife about this. Oh my God, Sharon exclaimed. I am terrified, and this sounds terrible. But we'll be prepared at 1, 30 in the afternoon, with the help of Agents Jackson and Pierce. Expected as the 1, 30 p. M. M. Arrival time was, the unexpected knock on the door startled the two women. Two agents, Pierce and Jackson, escorted them from the house to the waiting black SUV, but neither of them felt any better about it. In fact, it made them feel even more anxious. What's with this cloak and dagger stuff? Kathy and Sharon wondered, but they kept silent. I am glad to finally meet you both. Carolyn said with a hint of laughter as they walked into her office. Which one of you is Kathy? And which is Sharon? Proclaiming her identity as John's wife, Kathy Taylor. She took a step ahead. You can tell that Sharon and I are identical twins. She is my sister. Please, have a seat. I'll explain everything to you. Yes, of course, Carolyn said with a smile. Would you like me to grab you a drink? Some coffee or water before we begin? Coke or Mountain Dew, I believe we have. Everyone laughed as the two ladies said, No, I am fine. It's funny how twins always seem to have the same thoughts and feelings. Carolyn started. I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but before you panic, I have some good news. Oh no, oh my God, what has happened? The sisters were utterly taken aback and showed every indication of being worried and distressed. Just relax for a second, ladies. I'll tell you everything, Carolyn said. Excuse me, ma'am. The bullets have hit John. Three bullets struck him. Carolyn shouted, Stop it! In response to the women's cries and screams. Come on, I need to finish. Carolyn started to wrap up the story when Kathy and Sharon finally got comfortable. Please, don't interrupt me again. I'm sorry I got angry. They currently anticipate a full recovery for John, who was shot three times, but is still alive and in serious condition. The third shot hit the skull, while two of the others hurt the insides of the body. No longer are any of his injuries considered life-threatening, according to the physicians. We have halted the bleeding and made the necessary repairs. He suffered only minor injuries to his critical organs. So far, there has been no sign of infection, which is a relief. Rest assured, they are keeping a close eye on him. And if things take a turn for the worse, it will be dealt with promptly. He is still not completely well, but I have faith that he will be okay. The second is that a coma has set in for John. The medical professionals now agree that it is not a negative thing. In fact, putting certain people into a coma can help them recover faster. They view John's non-induced coma as a favorable development till a portion of his recuperation has taken place. I can assure you that this is a standard medical procedure that will greatly alleviate his discomfort and anxiety. I know it's upsetting for his loved ones. But believe me when I say they're seeing it as a blessing for his benefit. Kathy wanted to know, where is he? Am I allowed to accompany him? How did this unfold? Someone shot John three days ago. The drug lords had a hit guy shoot him. He is alive, and that is a miracle. Shooting him three times, once in the head and again in the chest, the hit guy clearly felt he had accomplished his mission. John was fortunate albeit we don't know why the bullets didn't kill him. For the first two days, he was quite ill, and... Carolyn paused for a moment before continuing. I know your marital status, Kathy, since John specifically requested that you not be informed of anything pertaining to his covert operations. He is expected to make a full recovery, 
so I was going to let him tell you everything, but I think it would be best for him, you, and us all if you were involved, so I called. At this point, Kathy was aware that three months before, John had phoned her sister, but Sharon had never informed her. However, after the last call to Carolyn, Sharon informed Kathy, and although she was unhappy about it, she couldn't have done anything even if she had known. John is receiving the greatest care possible in a secure medical institution. So that should settle any remaining doubts you may have, Kathy. Sure, you can go be with him if you're ready to follow the guidelines I'll lay out. Undercover, John had given us enough information to bust the entire upper Midwest drug distribution system. A hitman was sent to have him killed. The order came from above. John had compiled a list of 30 names of lower and middle echelon members and three or four names of upper echelon leaders. John's death was desired by all parties involved and their organizations were about to collapse. We are now protecting John as a witness. You will be required to enroll in the program alongside him if you intend to stay married if you choose to visit him. In any case, You'll have to disconnect from the world for as long as it takes for him to get well and be discharged from the hospital. We must cancel all of your plans. In addition to cutting off any contact with loved ones, you'll need to abandon your job or go on vacation. His safety and yours are paramount. Absolutely nothing will be tolerated. If you don't play by the rules, you might as well not survive. Additionally, you need to realize that this can be a long-term issue. They will cease their efforts to have him assassinated at some point. I will do anything to be with my husband, Kathy responded, her voice trembling with shock. Anything for him, because I love him. Everything you heard about our marriage is true. I messed up tremendously, yet I will also do all it takes to make things right with John. I will always be available for him if he needs me. Would you kindly lead me to him? While sitting there with her head lowered and tears flowing down her face, Sharon mumbled, I love him too. Her expression betrayed the anguish and disbelief she was experiencing. She had been silent throughout. I couldn't bear to be away from John, and I can't bear the thought of being away from Kathy either. Can I go too? Sharon added, causing Carolyn and Kathy to snap their heads to face her. I have always adored John and Kathy, and you know how much I love you. I will also do whatever that Kathy needs me to. Permit me to do this, please. Despite her initial reluctance, Carolyn eventually came around and decided to grant Sharon's odd request, if Kathy would only grant it. After all, Kathy had known about Sharon's affections for John for so long, and since she loved Sharon just as much, there was no way she could refuse her. I agree that it would benefit everyone involved. I was aware of John's love for me. Before I acted so foolishly, at least he did. I am aware that he loved you as well, sister, and that you love us both. It would benefit everyone here, I think. Go see him with us. All right, I can make that happen. But right now, you will be escorted to your homes to pick up any belongings that you must have now, Carolyn remarked, dumping some cold water on the duo. The next step is to come back here and finalize the plans to cut all links for a long time. You will be provided with lodging for the night, since I am assuming you will not be able to complete it today. Then you'll have all day tomorrow to finish off your tasks, and I'm guessing you'll be taken to see John by early afternoon. Does anyone have any inquiries? Why are we made to wait for so long? The sisters couldn't contain their frustration. We want to see him now. They spat in unison. This is my set of regulations, and you are obligated to adhere to them religiously. I apologize, women. I can assure you that doing so will benefit everyone involved. In the safe house's guarded bedroom later that night, the two women sobbed together. They were both aware that they would miss certain people and aspects of their lives for a while, but they were also both aware that they would do anything to be with John. Since they were estranged from their parents due to their ugly divorce, missing distant relatives and friends wasn't going to be their biggest problem. John had no remaining family and was quite work. Absorbed, 
so he had few friends as well. Kathy was certain that this plan would succeed if only John would forgive her for her foolishness and let her stay his wife. In an embrace, Kathy told Sharon, Sharon, I am incredibly sorry for all that has happened. Right now, you have no idea what I'm going through. Your advice would have prevented all of this. I wish I hadn't wanted to play with Phil and had been content with John's love. Without going undercover, leaving and being shot, John would not have done any of that. I wouldn't be haunted by the guilt of shooting John, and you wouldn't have had to sacrifice everything to be at our side. Why disregarded what you said? You were completely correct about everything, Kathy. Going there was a mistake. Even though you were smart enough to stop yourself before having sex with Phil, you still cheated and will never be able to get over it. I hope and pray that you and John can overcome that foolishness, because I think you two will. She then embraced Kathy and said, I love you, sis. You are part of me, and I am part of you. I want everything to be as wonderful as it was before you had your mental lapse. While Sharon slept soundly, Kathy endured a horrendously long night of tossing and turning, sobbing, and eventually drifting off to sleep. However, by the time they were awakened by a knock on their bedroom door in the wee hours of the morning, she was certain that she had slept for no more than three hours. I need you women to get up and start going because Agent Pierce said breakfast will be ready in one hour. At 11 o'clock in the morning, they had showered, dressed, and packed all of their belongings. They had had a small breakfast to keep them going and had completed all of the necessary last-minute calls and arrangements before heading to John. At about 12, 30 p.m. M. Oh, the SUV rolled into the emergency entrance of the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, man, about one, five hours south of the Twin Cities. The sisters were led inside the hospital and led to a guarded waiting room. The windows were blacked out, and the partition between the driver and the rear compartment was also blacked out. They were aware of the rationale behind the security measures, but they were nonetheless uneasy about them. At last, an official from the U.S. Marshal's office briefed Kathy and Sharon, and it was decided that they would not be required to formally enroll in the witness protection program until John had fully recovered and determined whether he wanted them present or not. As he lay on his back on the hospital bed, eyes closed, bandages clearly visible on his head, and tubes protruding from beneath the thin blanket that enveloped him, one could never tell that he had been so near to death at the hands of a gunman. Tears were falling from the cheeks of both sisters as they gazed at John. Doctor. Doctor. Mark Gordon, who is responsible for John's case, entered the room and asked the two women to a brief conference. If you must be in John's presence, I must impart upon you certain rules that you must obey. He is in a coma, but in all likelihood the subconscious mind is still working. Therefore, we need you to be soothing and gentle in your actions and words when you are in his presence. The lack of stresses while he is in this coma is good for his healing process, and we don't want that interrupted with difficult situations caused by his environment conscious or subconscious. Do you understand what I am asking? Then, Kathy and Sharon joined in saying, yes, we get it. Doctor X grinned. The unconscious harmony that twins would exhibit in their responses never failed to amuse him. He was also thinking, these twins are gorgeous, and this is one lucky guy to have two such beautiful women caring about him the way they obviously do. Now you two go spend some time with John, but remember to keep it low-key at all times. Thank you, doctor, said the doctor. We will do whatever is asked of us to help him recover. They brought the twins back into the room where they sat next to each other on John's bed. For the first time in four months, Kathy spoke to John, touching his hand as tears streamed down her cheeks once more. John, it is Kathy. I am here with you now and will do whatever I can to help you recover. Just relax and don't worry about a thing. I am here with you now and forever. Sharon is here for you too. All we both want is for you to get better. 
I love you, John. Sharon placed her hand on John's leg and announced, John, this is Sharon. We are both here for you now. You just get better for us. One or the other, or both of us, will always be by your side from now on. We want to see that smiling face of yours again soon. Time passed, and true to their word, John was never truly alone. At any one time, he may be joined by either of the women. Their hands were on his. They gently caressed his face and arms. They consulted with him. They engrossed him with books and periodicals. Along with him, they listened to music. Their tears often fell upon his arm or hand as they sobbed over him. They tenderly kissed him on all sides. John was accompanied by one of them at all times, thanks to the Witness Protection Group, which had arranged for them to live in an apartment close to the hospital. Everyone in the medical staff was astounded by the selflessness and compassion displayed by these two women. Time passed in a dizzying succession. Nearly three months had passed since John's shooting, and he had fully recovered physically. No longer could doctors detect any physical issues. His chest wounds had fully healed, and his head had also recovered. His system passed each and every one of the tests that were conducted on it. Those in the know speculated that his coma could be coming out at any moment, though no one knew for sure. They were hopeful, but couldn't give any indication of the timing. When he regained consciousness, they were once again in the dark about his mental state. Their one certainty was that his physical processes appeared to be functioning normally, leading them to believe that there was likely no serious brain injury. Afterwards, at about 8, 0, A, M, M. As John and Kathy sat together, he finally looked up at her. After John attempted to respond, Kathy quickly turned around and noticed that he was staring at her with his eyes wide open, something she had missed before. All she could say was, doctor, nurse, John, is awake. The employees, needless to say, began to flee the building like hens in a foxhole. Things calmed down and the physicians began to examine John after it seemed like nobody knew what to do. His eyes, ears, and nose were illuminated by these lights. Everyone was picking on the poor guy and asking him a million questions. At first, John spoke nothing but squeaks as he tried to speak. John was able to respond with a yes or no at some point, and the questioning persisted. After they finished asking questions, Sharon showed up to switch places with John. Oh, John, I am so happy to see you awake. We have missed you so. She finished by sitting down and taking John's hand as she sobbed uncontrollably. Kathy had been really quiet and uninvolved with John throughout this whole period. His reaction to her was something she feared. Still, she noticed that John glanced across at her with a perplexed look on his face. Why isn't Kathy saying what Sharon had? She was certain he was thinking to himself. It was determined by the medical staff that John had suffered a considerable loss of short-term memory. It seemed as if he hadn't remembered much from the past 12 months. He was completely unaware of the drug operations he had dismantled and had no recollection of being undercover. To avoid triggering a traumatic event that could put John back into a coma, the staff avoided talking about his personal circumstances. With the identical thought racing through their heads, Kathy and Sharon locked eyes. The question is whether John should know the truth about his marriage. The physicians advised them to ease off on John for a while and see if his memories from the past year resurface. A few days later, Kathy joined John in the chair and extended her hand to hold his. At this point, she felt it was necessary to inform John about what had transpired. My heart aches for you, John, and I want you to know how much I care that you are doing well today. I was terrified for you when we first arrived here, and I wished without hope that you would awaken from your coma. My deepest condolences on your recent memory loss. I will try my best to remind you of all the wonderful things that transpired in our lives at that time, since there were many. But John, there was one really bad thing that happened during that time that I am ashamed to tell you about, but I must tell you. 
She was unable to continue as her tears began to flow. John embraced her tightly and whispered, Kathy, it's all right. Just tell me. John, I was going to cheat on you with Phil Swanson. You found out and had me served with the separation papers we had executed when we were married. Then you left and went undercover. I hadn't spoken to you since then, until I saw you in this hospital. Kathy suddenly snapped out of her emotional funk. I deeply regret what I did, John. It was the gravest error I've ever made. I apologize. I can assure you that I abstained from having sex with Phil and anyone else throughout your absence. It was bad enough that I planned to do it, but I never really did it. I went so far as to hail a cab on my way out of the eatery. Oh, John, I wish I could go back and change all of that. I can't. I did it, and you left me over it, and I can't take it back. I am so sorry, he said. Why are you telling me this now, Kathy? You could have kept it from me, and I probably never would have remembered it. Because I love you, John, and because I couldn't go forward in our marriage with a lie as the foundation. I want you to love me, to forgive me eventually, for hurting you, and for being so stupid. I want us to have a life together, but it has to be on the basis of truth, not lies. I was ashamed to tell you, John, but I had to tell you if there was going to be any chance for us. Even though John was deeply wounded by Kathy's admission, it had no negative impact on his health. He informed Kathy that he needed time to consider her words and would address them with her at a later time. For a few days, he requested complete solitude. Three days later, on a Monday, John convened a meeting with Kathy, Sharon, his doctor Mark, and Carol, a nurse who had attended to him. Interestingly, John received an envelope from attorney William Barclay during that three-day period. The enclosed materials were explained in a letter written by his attorney. The letter stated, to whom it may concern. John, the divorce papers that you and Kathy signed when you were married have been formally filed with the court, as you had asked me to do. The divorce papers that were prepared at that time have also been filed with the courts since the six months from the filing date have elapsed. Kathy has filed for your official divorce. In the event that you require any further assistance, please do not hesitate to contact me. Best regards, Barclay. William Legal Counsel. John started meeting with his summoned parties after receiving that letter. I simply want to express my gratitude for your unwavering support throughout my extensive healing process and those moments when I struggle to remember details from the last year. I think I have complete recollection of all that was previously lost to me as of yesterday, and I wanted you all to know that. Doctor, I expect some to be curious about testing that notion, but I have faith that they will find evidence that backs up my claim. Now, I want to discuss my personal situation after Doctor. Gordon and Carol made their way to exit the room. John instructed them to remain still for a short while longer. He went on, Kathy. I have received notification that our separation, and in fact our divorce papers, were filed with the court systems per my request, and as of this moment, we are officially divorced. Neither Kathy nor Sharon could contain their shock. Then Kathy screamed out, Oh my God, John, no! Why did you do this without giving me a chance to make this up to you and work this out? As soon as I asked for the formal separation, Kathy, it was all taken care of. It was a provision in our agreement from way back when. The divorce will continue in its current form, and I will tell you that. On the other hand, I'd want to tell you why. Sharon was and is someone I loved, and you know that? When we finally met, I could tell we were meant to be. I fell head over heels for you the moment I laid eyes on you, even more than for Sharon. I still care deeply about you. How can I put an end to that? That wasn't the case back then. Unfortunately, my love for Sharon has grown stronger than my love for you, and the pain you caused me via your deeds has ripped a piece of my heart out. One other thing, Kathy, I don't know if I can trust you anymore. I promise I will never do that to you again, Kathy said. 
Oh, no, John. But, John went on, there's more evidence that makes me doubt your loyalties. Doctor, Gordon and Carol, I am requesting your confirmation of a conversation that I overheard in my unconscious mind when I was in a coma. This is what I heard. Mark, those twins sure are two beautiful women. I bet you have already hit on the sister-in-law. Well, yes, I did, Carol, but she wasn't having any of it. She appears to only have eyes for John. But one day, I thought I was flirting with her, and it was in fact the wife, and she told me that she wasn't interested. Then she smiled and said that maybe after things settled down, she might think about it. Kathy let out a very audible gasp. They gave Mark and Carol strange stares. John was confident that what he had heard was true, or at least sufficiently near to be understood without misunderstanding. Mark and Carol, is that indeed the conversation you had in this very room, when you thought I would not hear you? I need an honest answer. Just for once I want to know the truth. In response to the inquiry, they both nodded in embarrassment. Tears were falling from Kathy's eyes as she met John's gaze with an angry expression on her face. Sharon demanded to know her sister's mental state and asked, how on earth did you manage to pull that off? The confirmation broke John's heart, but he managed to keep it together. He looked at Carol and Mark and replied, you two can leave. All I wanted was verification of what I thought I heard. I guess you have learned that a person in a coma does indeed have a connection to what is going on around them. Doctor, Gordon and Carol departed from the room. John turned to Sharon and stated, Sharon, I want to enter witness protection proceedings after I testify in court against all those indicted on the basis of the information I have supplied. This is essential because individuals associated with them would almost likely attempt to assassinate me following my testimony. I would prefer if you accompanied me. Your unwavering devotion to me and the love you've always shown me have confirmed my deepest fears. I am no longer interested in proposing marriage, but that in no way diminishes my love for you. Accompany me, would you? No matter how foolish my sister is, I cannot remove her from my life indefinitely. John, you are aware of my love for you, and I would love to accompany you, Sharon stated. I just could not do that since she and I are interdependent. John anticipated Sharon's response and on to say, I knew you would tell me that. I fully expected that answer. That is the kind of person you are. She nodded in agreement. Even though I am deeply disappointed and saddened by Kathy, I still love her. If you agree, I will invite her to accompany us. I have already stated that I still love her. I still don't trust her and my love for you is greater than hers, so I will not remarry her. If Kathy decides to join us, will you accompany me? Absolutely I will, Sharon replied mirthfully. I realize this is a huge shock for you, Kathy, but you have to admit that you are completely responsible for this. You have my love, but I can't put my faith in you. I will just remove myself from your life if you ever betray me again. So, I will never remarry you. Just like that, no drama which you have duly acquired. I promise you that if you are ever unfaithful, I will leave you and any children we have from this relationship. If you agree to come with us, I intend to live with you, love you, and make love to both of you. I would like to have children with both of you, but you will both have to share me equally. Our relationship will never be the same after your actions broke the trust. Would you be willing to enter witness protection alongside Sharon and myself under these circumstances? Yes, John. I desire to be by your side, Kathy responded, her voice barely audible through her sobs. No matter how foolish I am, I love you so much, and without you, my existence would be meaningless. I swear I won't make the same stupid mistake twice. Okay, Kathy and Sharon, I've decided. From now on, I'll adore you equally. I want to create a life where we can all be happy. After that, John embraced the twins, kissed them both, 
and Kathy's tears stopped falling. The twins' grins, which had warmed his heart for years, told John that everything was going to be okay. Final Thoughts There were a number of cases in which John did testify against drug dealers and bosses. All of them were found guilty of at least one offense. The prosecution had no trouble proving their cases, and all of them were sentenced to prison terms ranging from five years to life without parole, marking a watershed moment in the history of criminal prosecution. Since John is high on the hit list for retaliation, his whereabouts are secret. The exact measures taken to hide their identities are undisclosed. But in essence, John, Kathy, and Sharon are non-existent anymore. The sisters were also relocated with him. John has become a prosperous businessman, and as a bonus, he has two lovely women in his life. He loves them both, and they love him back. They sleep together all the time, and he frequently makes love to both of them in the same bed. Neither of them seems jealous of the other, and John never has problems sleeping. With two girls, one of whom is three years old, and a boy, three, and a daughter in waiting, due in two months' time, John and Kathy have gone through a lot in the four years since this happened. John always puts a smile on his face before he goes to sleep. Kathy tells herself she will never make the same stupid mistake twice as she goes to sleep every night. Thinking about how fortunate she is to have John and Sharon in her life. At night, Sharon tells herself how lucky she is that Kathy was so naive. Now, she can spend her life completely with John the man she has loved her whole life. I fantasize of being John every night.